Welcome back to Streets and Eats. This week, we're doing episode 35, and we're going to be talking about turkey. So what will we say in Turkish? Hosh gelden is. That means welcome. Turkey is one of Jim's and my favorite, favorite countries. We've lived there for four years together, and I lived there as a kid um, during middle school, and even before that, um, we really, really have been all over the country and love it, and we can't wait to tell you all about it. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the travel and food podcast dedicated to taking our listeners to the sights, sounds, and flavors of fascinating places near and far, both on and off the beaten path. We're Jim and Corinne Vale, and we've been traveling internationally and domestically together for decades, visiting more than 90 countries in all 50 states in the USA. We'll share all of the local knowledge and food expertise we've gathered through years of living as expats in Asia and Europe, as well as traveling with families spanning multiple generations around the world. Join us each week for a new adventure. Yeah, we love Turkey. It's definitely one of our favorite places on, on, in the world. And yeah, you were born there, which was kind of almost problematic sometimes. Problematic? Yeah, because your passport said your birthplace was Ankara. And so people would automatically assume going through customs or wherever. Well, you showed your passport all the time in Turkey, uh, in, in hotels especially. So they would see that and think, oh, you're Turkish. and Go off speaking Turkish, thinking that we knew what they were talking about. So, and and my Turkish is is really good. I can order food from just about any restaurant. Now, anything else? Maybe that's a little past my my vocabulary, stretching it. But I I can say hi. How are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can get by a little bit. <laughs> Definitely, like we say, we won't starve to death in Turkish. That's for sure. And anybody that starves in Turkey anyway. Ooh. You're doing you something wrong. Not, yeah, you're doing something wrong because Turkish cuisine is some of the best on the planet. Not only that, but the people are some of the most welcoming on the planet and they will invite you to try whatever foods or come have tea with them. Uh, you you should never go hungry there. We had an accident one time when we were there. Not the, not the best way to talk you into going on a trip maybe, <laughs> but we had a car accident one time and we must have had how many 10, 12 so offers many, of dinner. So many glasses of chai, offers to go home for dinner, uh, hand rolled cigarettes. Thank you, but no thank you. Yeah, all kinds of stuff like that. The people are very hospitable and they really want to take care of visitors and guests, especially. Um, so now for this episode, we are going to be working out our top five things to do, places to go type, type thing in Turkey. In the country of Turkey, which may not be on everybody's list mm. to visit, but he, l hear us out. It should be. It should be. It should be way up there. It is the crossroads of Europe Western and Asia. civilization. And, yeah. And has been, obviously. So here's the thing. Everybody has heard of the exotic city of Istanbul. And, you, and it's true. Istanbul is one of the most exotic beautiful, mesmerizing cities to visit. I mean, I just can't say enough about it. The food is good. The views are good. There's plenty of things to do and see. Culture. The history is amazing. Art, everything. Yeah. So a lot of people, if they think about going to Turkey, they'll think about going to Istanbul. And I, I don't disagree. Everybody definitely should go to Istanbul. And I'm not going to put it in my top five because no, no. I think that everybody always thinks about going to the big cities. It's the other places in the country that people don't always think about that are just as worthy as the bigger cities. Yeah. And well, I could do easily a top five Istanbul without ever leaving, leaving the city. What we, what we like to say is, Go to Istanbul. You have to go to Istanbul. Enjoy it. Love it. Fall in love with it, just like we did. But then if you can, make time to leave the city and go see Turkey. Go see the rest of Turkey because uh, while, yeah, Istanbul is in Turkey and there's a lot of what is Turkish in Istanbul, there's a lot of what's Turkish that's not in Istanbul. You don't get the, the small villages. You don't get the sweeping vista landscapes of the Anatolian plain. Uh, you don't get the 
the gigantic Congol shepherd dog mm. chasing down your car as you drive through a village. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't get that in Istanbul. And that really is the whole experience. Or, you know, invited into somebody's, uh, what are those? Those beehive, beehive huts houses in, in Haran. Ha Haran. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. To go share tea with a, fa with a family in a very primitive mud brick house. Those experiences are priceless. So we're going to be presenting our five. And, and I've come up with my five. Uh, and you've come up with your five. Yeah, we it's, haven't it was, talked about it yet right. together, but what we'll do for this episode is we'll each present one at a time. We'll talk about them. And then at the end, we'll, we'll rank f the top five from the ones that we both came up with. So we'll have a final list of five. And it and might be a little bit of fisticuffs here. We both have very strong opinions. We do. But <laughs> I also suspect that we have a lot of overlap. Well, you know, a lot of what we like is going to be from our experiences and we, we experienced together. together. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I agree with you. But at the same time, we, we bought a, a Jeep, I think after the first year that right. we moved there and right. we lived there for four years and we put about 80,000 miles on that Jeep in those four years, uh, all in Turkey. Cause you can't really leave you can't really leave the country with your vehicles. It's very difficult to do. Uh, and it's a gigantic country. And we, I think, drove around the south, the east, the north, the west, everywhere in the middle. I mean, we have seen We really Turkey. tried to leave no column or stone unturned. So I'd be surprised if all five of our things matched because we just have so many different experiences. But even though we did them all together, uh, like I think there's one or two that I've picked that that are things that I'm really interested in that you probably aren't. Okay. But well, we'll we see. Will, we will soon see. All right. So we started out by saying that everybody goes to Istanbul, but Istanbul, surprisingly enough, is not the capital of Turkey. That's right. So my number five pick only because there's so many other places that I went that I had really amazing experiences um, otherwise it would be way up there because it's, it's a city everybody should go to, but I put it as my number five pick is Ankara. Yeah. Ankara. I didn't put it on my list. I didn't think you would, but why did I pick Ankara? Well, a, it's the capital B it's thousands of years old. You can see Roman ruins there from 2000 mm -hmm. years ago, the area around Ankara. Of course, there's plenty of cute little towns and cities to go visit there. Um, they have the best food they have, even though it's a city, they still have the old markets right alongside malls and, you know, huge shopping centers. So oh, yeah, the you, open air produce markets. So you get, you get the modern and the antique all in one, you know, one little go. Um, plus it's, you know, it's very cosmopolitan. It's where the parliament is. Um, that's where lots of the museums are. Some of the best museums in the country always go, all the artifacts go to those museums. So for me, going to the capital city is always really important. And yet I don't think that many people think about going to Ankara. If they're going to choose a huge city, they're almost always going to choose Istanbul. So that's why I put it on there. Well, and it's kind of like the birthplace of the modern Turkish Republic as well. So you've Absolutely. got all the Ataturk um, museums and, and history there as well. Uh, I definitely thought about putting it on my list because there's a lot in Ankara that I really do love for sure. Uh, and if we were looking at food, definitely some places in Ankara would be on my list. Only because those are the places we went to, just like you do when you're living anywhere in the States, you have your favorite restaurants and we would go back again right. and again and become regulars. And I would go to Ankara. Just to eat. Just to eat. Just eat at those places for sure. So but, like but the really, Goksu or uh, Ulu Dog. Mm -hmm. mm, oh, yes. There's a lot of good food there, too. But the sites are fantastic. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't overlook the sites. The Kale, the old castle where you climb all the way up the hill. And it's almost like an old Turkish village up in the middle of the Kale. And you can look out across the city of four million people. Great views. Oh, yeah. And you can buy, you can find everything up in that, up in that area around the Kale. Uh, carpets, rugs, 
copper. We would get our wrought iron, r- our wrought iron things made up there. Uh, woodworking, antiques, textile scarves, rugs, spices, dried fruits and nuts. Oh yeah, it was all up there, and good food, of course, everywhere. Uh, yeah, so I yeah, I don't know if I'll. I'll allow it to be in the total, in the ending top five. Well, plus I was born there. You should love it just because yeah, of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, but we'll see. We'll oh, by see. the way, I was born there because my dad was an Air Force, um, in the Air Force at the time, stationed as a security policeman um, in Ankara. And he met my mother there, who was a Dodds teacher. She was so a she teacher. taught yeah. military children. And they didn't know each other before Ankara. So they met, married, had me, and. Neither one's Turkish. Yeah. You're not Americans. Turkish. Yeah. But yeah, people, the, the Turkish people especially loved seeing Ankara as your birthplace. Yeah. Well, my first one on my first, list. Which means number five, right? Your uh, fifth choice? My fifth choice. I, had, I didn't really order them yet, but I can do that as I, as I announce them, I guess. Uh, my fifth place, I guess would, would be, well, that's really hard. We're going to have a hard time actually We're ranking gonna, these at the end. There is definitely more than five places that I think everybody should go. Everybody, yeah. Oh, yeah. not some people, but everybody. Everybody. Well, okay. So, uh, Yazilakaya is, I'll put that at number five. Uh, and that is a, a set of ruins out in the, just out in the Anatolian plains Nothing around for, I would say, 50, 60 kilometers, uh, but farmlands, uh, s- uh, small hills, and just open area. And there's a Midas tomb, a Midas monument that's carved on the face of this cliff. It's massive. And the re- re- really old remains of a very old Phrygian city. We're talking 6th, 7th century BC. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can see areas where a cart path was carved out through the side of a hill and the tracks of the carts that have been run through centuries through that little track. Jim loves an old road. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I really love the monument in the area and the ruins, of course. But more than that, this whole area is kind of crisscrossed with these really random small gravel roads that just kind of meander around the hills and down through valleys and past ruins and farmland. And uh, it's just a a really cool place where you can get so lost, but yet still find your way out uh, and see some amazing scenery along the way. Uh, And I really love that about Turkey. The fact that you can do that. I I think even the, the ruins may be different and the actual timing of the ruins are all different. Like you said, this is a ancient, ancient Phrygian city, which was amazing. I'm not going to lie. Um, they are sort of scattered all over the Anatolian plain. And what's amazing is Yazokaya is not far from a little town called Sifrisar. And there, there's this beautiful mosque that you can go into mm-hmm. and it just has the most amazing light. And it's just it, it it's it's like it's from a storybook. You can almost hear the imam, you know, praying, even though you might not be there or probably aren't going to be there during prayer time. Um, another little town that's not far from there is a city called Eskashir. And when I lived in Turkey and when I lived in middle school, my dad um, used to go to Eskashir quite a bit. So we had friends there. And Eskashir is known for their Mersham pipes. So a lot of that's people... Right who've been to Istanbul or been to Turkey, they may have gotten a Mersham pipe, but they didn't know where its origin was. And that would be Eskashir. And you can go to Eskashir and watch them carving the pipes the or whatever. The artisans are still there carving mm-hmm. pipes to this day. And, and we're they talking, have, the pipes are, it's, if you're not familiar with a Mersham, it's a very soft white stone. Um, that almost is, chalky. Yeah, that is excellent for carving. Um, but at, when it gets heated up, it hardens. So it's perfect for a pipe, a tobacco pipe. That's the type of pipe we're talking about here. Uh, but they carve other things out of it as well. If you're not a smoker, and even if you aren't a smoker, they are still beautiful pieces of art. Beautiful. Uh, a lot of times they'll do Ottoman a sculpture of Ottoman a sultan or warrior or uh, beautiful women, ships, all kinds of stuff. 
So yeah. those are really cool. Yeah, I well, forgot about so that. I do like Yazokaya. There's not much about turkey I don't like. But yeah, I'll have to see where that ends up on the list. Okay. So what's your number four? My number four was, for lack of better place to put it, Gaziantep. And when I say Gaziantep, I, I kind of mean the whole area down in southern Turkey. You already mentioned um, Haran, yeah. Haran, the little town that's not far from there with the beehive houses. Um, and then there's another town called a city nearby called Shanlirfa, which is really cool. It has a, a very famous mosque that that there's many pilgrimages to, mainly to see the carp in the moat um, and feed the carp because of the story of Abraham sacrificing his son. Um, it's a well, well visited site for Muslim visitors, but you don't often see a lot of foreigners there. Um, there's also um, one of the things that a lot of people may have heard about just recently. Um, and it's the ancient site of Gebekli Tepe which is they're uh, they're looking at 13 14,000 years old and they've uncovered these temple figures and um i guess columns that they've carved into animal um, reliefs with and animal like reliefs that. and yeah. things yeah um so that's all in the area but the city of Gaziantep itself is just a bustling mecca of old timey uh, Silk Road goodness. It's got it's it's well known for its baklava. Yes, it's the famous place for baklava. And if you run into anybody here who's Turkish and serves baklava, if they're not from Gaziantep, they almost always will still mention Gaziantep yes. because it's that well known. Um, and the place to get it is a little restaurant called Imam uh, Shadas which we would go to every time we were in the city. They also have a beautiful mosaic museum there where you can see muse uh, mosaics, Roman mosaics have been pulled up from all around the area. Like I said, the whole Anatolian plain is just littered with ruins. And one of the things that you'll often come across is this flat space on a ground near a ruin or in a ruin that's covered with plastic or something. And if you are able to get a copy GM, a maintenance worker manager to help you move that, you can usually see part of a, an amazing Roman mosaic that's still intact and still just out there on the plane. In situ. Um, in situ. Yes. Um, but lots of times they've also moved them to preserve them as well. Um, there's lots to do in the town. The bazaar, um, the market area is fabulous and it, I swear to you, it's just like straight out of a movie. I mean, you think you were in Casablanca or something with the winding cobblestone roads. Oh, I, I think it's a lot more like, um, like the scenes from Aladdin where they're yeah. running through the market area and it's very close in with the buildings, but you still have all the different wares for sale and fruits. And, uh, the one thing I really like about Gaziantep is the leather market. Mm -hmm. They've got great leather goods there. Uh, yeah. And all that stuff is just like packed in these little, this warren of alleys. And oh yeah. Yeah. I like God's on tip too. And the they thing have about, one of the best civilization museums on the planet. One of the things I try to think about when I was making my list is access like Yazilkaya. Amazing. You need a vehicle, but you need a vehicle to get out there. Now driving in Turkey is a risk. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a great reward. But it, with risk comes great reward. I agree with you. Um, however, it's it's much harder to get to. And you're not going to find any um, or very few tours that would include it because it is yeah, something yeah. that is way, way. Coach tours aren't going out there. But for me, again, that's the draw for it. Well, I agree. But it's so far off the bottom, the beaten path that I think it's almost inaccessible for some people. Whereas Gaziantep has a couple of airports. You can fly right in there oh, yeah. from, you know, change over in Istanbul or whatever. Airport. And it's cheap. Inner city bus. And it's easy. Yeah. Um, and plus there's plenty to see and do in that whole area and it's well, well worth it. You can go even further. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the p other places that you could possibly see if you were going on a road trip because we might bring those up. They might come up. Mm -hmm. uh, well, luckily, Sean Lerfa is not on my list. Go back to Tepe. 
it, made, it was close. Uh, Haran was not on my list either. It was very close. That's amazing. So all the places I mentioned in the Gaziantep area were not on your list? None of those are on my list. But they were amazing places. But they really are amazing places. Uh, but I went with Yazokaya in that position because of its remoteness. Mm, I wanted to put in one of those remote places that um, I think really captures, you really feel like you could be somewhere back, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Well, you could certainly, certainly use it as a muse. If you had the time to just sit there and sort of listen to the wind, you could almost hear stories being told right to right. you because it is so ancient. It's out on the plain. There's nothing around it. Like I said, there's things not far from it, but still not within sight. Yeah. So and we would do Yazokaya as a, uh, something we would do on our way to other places. Uh, it was rarely, I think we only once went to Yazokaya to go to Yazokaya. Um, but my recommendation to people to go into Turkey is if they can arrange a rental car for a week and spend a week touring the countryside and, and finding those smaller places, going to these places that are on our list. Or maybe being able to hire a driver. Yeah, you can do that as well. Okay, so my next one then would be um, hmm, Bay Pizari, which is mm. very close to Ankara. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I almost put Bay Pizari down. And I almost said Ankara and included Bay Pizari in it, but I'm going to say Bay Pizari by itself mm. because uh, you can fly into Ankara and you can make Ankara a base and you can do all of the things on my list at least um, could be done using Ankara as a base or maybe one of two bases. So Bay Pizarre is this old Ottoman village uh, on the plains, of course. And it's just got a stunning backdrop driving into it. It's at the edge of a very small mountain range that uh, doesn't have jagged peaks, but it has jagged cliff faces uh, and gulches and valleys that are just cool as you're driving in. Uh, but then you get into this village and it's the old Ottoman wooden houses uh, in the center of town. And they've done a great job of preserving the feeling of a village while um, allowing tourism to flourish. So it's not, the houses aren't full of souvenirs that were made in China or um, Indonesia and then brought in for sale. These are local handicrafts when they're handicrafts. A lot of like wool socks that have been knitted by the, the local. Which um, I never women. passed up. Uh, wooden spoons that have been carved, knife making, copper, of course, uh, carpets, things like that. Um, my favorite, of course, is the food. <laughs> they're very. Well, it's a very agricultural area. That's right. And, it, and it's all uh, homemade products. Mm hmm. Um, so they're pretty much making everything right there. They're producing everything that they need to make the final product. Um, so if it's the baklava, they've, they've been growing the wheat and, and they've made the, the um, yufka. yufka and the walnuts were grown there. And, you know, maybe the sugar had to come from somewhere else, but probably even that came from sugar beets that were growing in the exactly area. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and so we would have this one baklava house that we would go to. And they would just bake these gigantic round tins of baklava. I'm talking like four or five feet in diameter. And you would go in there and get this baklava. Now it's different baklava than what we would get in Gaziantep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and like, it wouldn't be considered by the Turks as good as anything in Gaziantep. Exactly. But for us, especially as foreigners, first of all, it was delicious, whether it was the best or not is beside the point. But for us, it was also, it was the family that ran the That's place. Right. It was the experience of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was good baklava, but it was not like, I wouldn't go out of my way to get the baklava. I would go out of my way to go there and have tea and baklava and chat with, with they the also family made, that ran the place that made the baklava. And, they also made and sold stuffed grape leaves. Oh, that's right. So we, I, and I mean, uh, as well as other things, but the stuffed grape leaves and the baklava, they were almost a given. We would go almost every time we went to Bay Bazaar and since it was about an hour to an hour and a half from Ankara, we went, I would say almost once a month. 
Mm-hmm. We we rarely let a couple of months go by before we would go back to Bay Bazaari because we always wanted to go eat there. There was always new produce that was um, in season. Uh, the cherry season there was amazing. The tomato season was also amazing. And I mean, people would just bring back flats and flats and flats. Well, of course, they would come back with bottles of carrot juice. And carrots. Because, because what they were really known for produce-wise was the carrots. And Habuch. right, Habuch. right at the beginning of the old town, the main street that would go up through the old town, the walking street, uh, they had uh, a traffic circle, of course, because you couldn't drive up into the old town. And that was the turnaround point. But in the middle of the traffic circle, they had a giant havuch, a giant carrot uh, symbolizing the city. And you could just walk up the street, find a little stall where they'd set up a table and a and a portable juicer, and they're just... It was delicious. Spitting out the carrot juice. It's so fresh and so delicious. Yeah. Okay, so I love Bay Pizzari. And I think anybody who goes to Turkey should go to Ankara, rent a car, and go to Bay Pizzari. But you got to get to Ankara first. So I would kind of put <laughs> Bay Pizzari with Maybe Ankara. we can include that with Ankara. We'll because keep, to me, we'll they're Ankara almost on the one and the same. We went so often. Okay, I'll, I'll say you can keep Ankara on the list, provided we include Bay Pizzari in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll see. But yeah. Okay. What's next for you? For me? Okay. So we only did this once, really. But we had this wonderful drive up to the Black Sea. And we had the most amazing experience. Here we are kind of just looking at all the little villages. And we come to this one little village that's known for its quote unquote Swiss chalets, where you can stay for a night or two or a week or whatever. Um, And you're often in a house with a family, but you're not really, I mean, you're kind of, it's kind of like a B and B. I guess it's like a B and B. Yeah. But maybe in a like very a Turkish shared, way. <laughs> or maybe like a room in an Airbnb where you don't just have a room and not the whole house. And they didn't really feed you there. But of course, they're Turkish, so they did. I mean, but it wasn't official and you would go out to eat as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and again, what was here. The the town? I don't remember. Oh, my gosh. So one of the things that you would, well, first of all, it's up in the hills and it's all very green and um, all these little wooden huts are around and it's really beautiful. The ladies are sitting out there and they're knitting, like Jim said, all the socks, which I was just in love with. So I never, ever went anywhere without buying some. And um, the food was amazing. But we happened to be there on a Sunday afternoon. And the people who inhabit this whole area are a people called the Laws people. They wear their scarves different than regular Turks. They, um, they're kind of like a tribe, I guess. They're a they're an ethnic group, and they all live sort of in the mountains, or some live in the villages, and some live far out. They all come to the village on Sunday afternoons, and they have big picnic, and they all dance, and everybody's invited, and we had the time of our life. We danced all afternoon. We shared, you know, drink and tea with um, some people. We met and this lady who was a grandma and she and her grandson were playing soccer all over the field for hours. And it was just this communal where you, you would meet up with old friends, but you would also be with just your family group if you wanted to. And it was a lot of fun. And the whole area is beautiful. The Black Sea is gorgeous. Um, it's it's just a different part of Turkey. It feels different. It looks different. And it's so well worth going to. It was like in the Rize Artvin area, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't find it. Well, we'll put a link for it in our show notes. Yeah, we'll find it. So it's not a big deal. We'll find it. Yeah, I really like that too. I kind of put that with... Uh, kind of in the same category as my Yazokaya, even though it's, I mean, it's different because we're not talking uh, ancient history, but we are talking remoteness and um, really getting out into the countryside of Turkey. So hmm, I don't know. I don't know if we I had so many good experiences. You really, in Turkey. you do talk about that quite often and you really did love that. I did. Um, I, I found it very interesting and I enjoyed it. I don't know if I put it in my top five. Okay. 
Well, what would you put in your third well, space? My next place is getting harder and harder to actually put them in a ranking position as we get closer to the top. Um, but this is a place that I really, really love. And uh, for a variety of things. Wait, let me guess. Is it Olba? No, that's higher on my list. Because <laughs> <laughs> you really love it. That's oh, why yes. I said that. Uh, so in this particular area, you have a, a really incredible natural phenomena. Plus you also have Roman ruins and you have kind of an interaction with the Roman ruins in hot springs where you can swim. You know what I'm talking about? Hot springs? Mm-hmm. This, I'm talking about... Are Pum- you talking about Pamukkale? I'm talking about Pamukkale. Uh, Is that on your list? You know what? It's on the. It's in the margin. Ah, uh, Pamukle. Yeah, yeah. So, because um, it is an amazing place altogether. When you've when you're researching Turkey and you're looking at the guidebooks and you're looking at things to do in Turkey, I'm pretty sure Pamukle is going to come up. Oh, it, it's definitely going to come up. An area where um, natural hot springs are coming up high at a higher elevation, and then. Uh, seeping downhill and over the side of a cliff and all the minerals that are in the spring water as it goes over the side of the cliff collects in these natural, um, very white chalky looking pools where the water inside turns this really beautiful blue color. Uh, and the whole cliff side is covered with these and it's really an incredible site. Uh, they've converted some of them to where you can enter them and swim and not swim, but bathe in the water. Well, you're really waiting. None of them are that deep, exactly. really. And uh, Pamukkale means cotton castle. Cotton castle. And it does look like a castle. And it could even be like a cotton candy castle sort of cascading down the mountain. So yeah. it's really aptly named. It's it, Yeah. And it's just beautiful. So those on their own, I think, are worth a visit. <laughs> yeah. And but, it's a World Heritage Site as well. But because it had these uh, natural springs... Right. And and because of its uh, geographic location, it was also a very large Roman city uh, that grew up there. Hierapolis. Called Hierapolis. Mm -hmm. And it still has a a massive arena and a a theater um, that are in really good shape. It's got quite a few buildings that have been uh, restored. What I like about Hierapolis... Mm. And compared to a lot of Roman ruins that I've been to, um, is that you can get a feel for the sheer size of it. it That's of right. It. You can walk. Oh, my gosh. We walked for miles. And you're walking through. And you're walking uh, through ruins. City ruins. Yeah. Whereas in most Roman ruin places, you're walking through mounds of stone or uh, areas that have been overgrown or covered over the millennia um, or over the years, I should say. And you know that it's there, but you're not walking through a city. But on Hierapolis, you are walking through a it, city. It feels like you're walking through a city. You could almost imagine it out of, you know, a movie or something with the people going to market and having their horse cart and their donkeys. And mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. You can just imagine it because there's so many buildings. There's so much to see. So you... You have the Pamukkale, you have the, the the natural phenomena of the pools, then you have the Roman ruins, and then you have an area of the Roman ruins that have been converted into pools, where I, I believe it was an old... It was, Two swimming pools, like modern day pools. swimming pools. It was an old, originally an old Roman bath, um, and the water was still coming up into the baths through the hot springs. So they just did some work on it, some renovations, and turned it into a swimming pool. But they did such a fantastic job because what they've done is they enclosed a a very distinct pool area and left some of the columns Mm -hmm. and the ruins are incorporated in the pool inside the pool. So you're swimming around Roman ruins. And uh, they're called Cleopatra's Pool. That's Cleopatra's Pool. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, and you think of hot springs, you think, and every hot spring I've been to, other than these ones, have been really hot. 
but these are the most comfortable temperature. Perfect. I don't know if it's Perfect the altitude or just, just the water itself, the, the temperature way it of the water. Is. But it's it's you can go winter or summer, and it's. I don't, I don't know what, I can't tell you what the actual temperature is. I'm sure you could look it up, but it's comfortable. It's warm. It's soothing. And you can just see Cleopatra on the side there fanning herself. Or, well, actually having someone fan her yeah, with huge course. ostrich yes. feathers. She would not or be something. fanning herself. No. <laughs> Two or three. Yeah. It is be a beautiful her. place. I totally agree with that. And uh, it, it's in another place that, um, it's all by itself in some ways, but there's not far from there are other really yes. cool things to do. And there Turkey. will be, you can definitely get tours to the area mm -hmm. from, from anywhere you're going to be in Turkey. Yeah. If you take a, you know, whether you take a group tour or whether you just want to take a tour to go see that um, alone, you, you can easily set that up. That is very accessible yes. because right. it's a world heritage site and it's very famous. All right. Intercity bus will get you to the town nearby and, uh, there's a small, a small van that you can hop on and it'll take you up there or a taxi or an Uber. Uh, so yeah, very accessible. Yeah. So we might have to make sure that's on the list because that's we both be did actually list. write it down. I just had to sort of move it over for other things. It's, it off. Five is five is not enough. I mean, it really needs <laughs> to be the top 10, but we were committed to five. So. Yep. Okay. So my next one. And it's kind of what I was talking about when you said Olba is Kiz Kalesi yeah. and the area around Kiz Kalesi. Well, I, su I suspect that our next, our, our last few we've matched. I, probably. I don't see how we can I have. I don't know that I, see, I may have put it in a different position, but it's definitely on my list. So I wrote it down as Kiz Kalesi because that was always our, our actual end goal. We used to, used to stay in Kiz Kalesi and Kiz Kalesi is this little town um, on the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. and it's super special because there's it's just small. There's not a whole lot of people there. There are a few resorts, but there's never too many tourists. And on the public beaches, I mean, there's a few Turks, but I mean, we've been there all the you know. We don't usually go in the mid summer. Of summer it gets crowded. It probably gets crowded then. Mm. We never went then. We always went in the fall because the water yeah. in the mid is so beautiful in the fall. But it does get crowded in the, in the summer for sure. Um, and what's special about it is it has two castles um, that you can explore. One is onshore and it's just off the beach, and you can you know climb around it. Piece of cake, a couple of euros to get in. Um, I mean, a couple of lira. And then you, the other one is offshore. It used to be connected to the shore by a sort of a little tiny land bridge, but that's fallen into the sea and you have to actually swim to it or boat to it to get to it. But it's only 200 meters and it's an easy swim. So we've swum to it. And the only thing is you need to wear water shoes, but you scramble up on the rocks and here you are in the middle of a castle. It's yeah. fabulous. An old... Uh, I want to say Ottoman castle, but then was taken over by the Crusaders. Uh, so it's got the Crusader history. And yeah, where else can you swim to a castle uh, out in the middle of the bay? And it's beautiful water. It's perfect swimming water. Uh, we're not talking surfing, of course. Uh, definitely, because Glazy is on my list. And I probably did the same thing you did. I wrote Cuscalese, but I'm including a couple of the places with that. Yeah, because we used to go down there at least once a year because it was one of our places that we love so much. The food is fabulous. We got to know the people down mm. there. Um, some friends of ours had apartments and we used to go there and uh, meet up with them. So we did boat trips out on the Med where we would the boat takes you to these uh, underground the underwater pool caves. or underwater caves. Yeah. That are really cool to go to Finish up with a seaside, uh, seafood dinner. Mm -hmm. The sunsets were amazing. I mean, just the fact so, that you can swim to the Glazy, castle. Yes. On the water. And then in the Hills ab above the beach, um, it's this old farming community, which is just fun to drive through. Uh, it's got old crusader, era churches it's got yeah. of course old ottoman tombs mm -hmm. uh roman ruins uh and i've so it, with because glazy i included olba and uzunjabirch mm -hmm. which i figured you did as well and so those are the roman ruins above the town 
Uh, we're talking about a, a 30 minute drive. Yeah. Only half an hour or so but out of mainly town. Mainly because you're winding your way through fields and village uh, to get to the. And there's no gas there. stations around there. So if you didn't yeah. fill up in Kiskalesi, then you might be in trouble, except one time we saw that the gas truck will come to you. Yes. <laughs> If you can catch the truck as it's heading between villages, it will stop and fill up your vehicle. We saw one person flag him down and fill up his tractor, uh, an Esso truck. That's right. Uh, and that was at Olba. And now Olba is a uh, Roman aqueduct. A Roman aqueduct that spans across a valley, uh, partially fallen down. I think it's probably got two or three of its uh, arch of its arches left, uh, and it's two levels high. And you can just scramble all around the area. You can follow the aqueduct as it makes its way through the hills. So you can see where those um, trenches were were dug out and lined with stone. Um, but the the aqueduct itself crossing the valley is probably the most spectacular view I think in in all of Turkey. Well, and it's so d- deserted. And it's deserted, remote. There's nobody there. It's really not that far from civilization, as we said, but nobody goes there. And it's, of course, the aqueduct. What was this your list? Oh, this is yours. So you can keep going. Kiss Classy? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I mean, we both we, have it. So. We both have it. So I think you can chip in. I'm, okay. Well, you want to talk about Uzunjabirch? Uzunjabirj is one of my favorite places, too. Yeah. Again, it's just a village, and there are some Roman ruins there. There's a temple of Athena. And we're talking old stones, no matter what. Mm. One time we went there, there was a shepherd, an old lady. She couldn't have been younger than 85. One cow. And a whole herd of, she- of goats. Yeah. Yeah. So they were wandering all around the ruins. Um, and that was, I think that was the first time we went there. But we also met um, one of our Turkish friends there, and he and his wife always invited us in for dinner. And so we would go back year after year after year. And the first year she was pregnant, and of course after that she had the baby, and then the next year, little toddler. It was just so cute to see the progression of the family growing. and go back and and visit and we would just bring chat. Photographs that we took the year before, we'd bring to them, and mm-hmm. and we only gifts. saw them once a year, but we always look forward to it. And there was always near the ruins, near the temple, there was always a couple of vendors, just some village women who sold whatever goods they had or whatever. Um, Knitted socks, of course. Well, yeah. And they also had scarves where you have the embroidery on it. And they also did things like if they picked wild spinach, they would bag that up and sell it. That's right. Or berries. Uh, They also made homemade wine in that area from the grape vines that were growing throughout the ruins. That was pretty good stuff. I, I think you can tell from our choices, and I'm sure our number one choice is going to be the same, very much the same, that a lot of what we suggest people go to Turkey for is to meet the people. Mm. And that's why I think that we suggest getting out into the villages and getting away from both Ankara and Istanbul, the huge cities, or Izmir, which so many people go to. And they're, and they're great places. Don't get me wrong. I love them. But at the same token, and you'll meet great people there too, by the way. But at the same time, if you go out into the villages and you spend some time um, traipsing around ruins that are out in the middle of nowhere, you're bound to meet some people. Definitely a richer experience. A very rich experience. Okay. So number one. Cappadocia. Cappadocia. Yeah. Gourmet, Urgoop, uh, Cappadocia for sure. The whole area around there, Mustafa Pasha, um, Daring Kuyu. Um, Cappadocia is not a town. It is a region. region. And it's the region that many people have heard of where the fairy chimneys are, which are spectacular. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's a geological feature um, where that whole part of the plains had been covered in uh, volcanic ash. We're talking hundreds of feet deep, maybe a thousand feet deep. And hardened throughout the years. And it makes a stone called tufa. And uh, this stone is very soft, especially when it's freshly dug into. So as you dig into it and it gets exposed to air, it hardens, uh, becomes uh, much more firm and stable. And so what happens is you would have erosion occurring over the, over the millennia. And 
you would end up with these conical, giant conical towers that would just rise up, that are now just rising up out of a, a valley floor. And those by themselves are spectacular. You'll have just like a forest of these stone towers all around you as you walk through a really bucolic area. And that's very cool. But because of the nature of the stone, it's very easy to manipulate. And a lot of them have been dug into and turned into residences or barns or uh, jail cells. Well, you're talking mostly now that's what they are. Yeah. But in the past, one of the things that's really cool about this area, that's where some of the crusaders hit out. That's right. When they're being prosecuted. Uh, by the Ottomans. Um, so that was a very large community uh, of Christians at the time. So now we're talking churches that have been dug out of the stone. With amazing frescoes. With incredible frescoes. Um, and that's the, that's the Gourmet Open Air Museum. Uh, and that's definitely a place you need to go. Well, what else in Cappadocia? Oh, you know, we had a lot of favorite places. Mm. Um, well, we would go to Cappadocia again at least once a year, but more likely twice a year. Yeah, because every season is different yeah. and beautiful. And and we've definitely been in every season and we've taken, I don't know that we went there if we ever had a visitor and not taken them there. No, you have to go. So we would always take people there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, one of the iconic places that you have to visit in Turkey. And even though it's probably almost as iconic as Istanbul, it's also out in these smaller little cities and towns. And you have to try a lot harder to do some of the things because, you know, you either have to take a tour or rent a driver or take a taxi because um, they're spread out. It's a whole region. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of things, lots and lots of things to do there. You can do everything from seeing uh, belly dancing shows and whirling dervishes to going to ceramic studios and, watching them make the ceramics as they have for the last, you know, thousand years, thousand, 2000, 3000 years. Um, horseback riding, ATV, ATV riding, balloon, um, definitely balloons. hot air ballooning is very popular there. Uh, we've done just about all of it. And I'm going to say we've never been disappointed. The food there is amazing. It doesn't matter what you have, but one of the things that are iconic, especially in the gourmet area, and we used to stay in Gourmet pretty much every time, specifically to go to this one restaurant. It was called... Um, Debeck. The Debeck. And the first time we went there, we became friends with some people from Singapore who were also touring. And they became lifelong friends. We're still in contact that's right, with them. That's right. Um, but on top of that, we became friends with a proprietor named Mehmet. And at the, you know, when we first met him, he was in his early 30s. And of course, he's gotten a little older by now. Um, and we met his father and his mother, and they all ran the little place together. And in fact, he had been born in the barn loft of that building That's right. before they turned it into a restaurant. Um, so he told us his history, and he made the famous um, gourmet tepsi kebab, mm -hmm. which is a stew that's made in a glass no, so, uh, a, a clay, a clay, almost bottle shape. And you, of course, bake it for a minimum of three hours so that everything is really tender. And then you have to break off the top because it's sealed. Mm -hmm. And then they pour it out into your bowl and you serve it up from the bowl. And it's delicious. With your pilaf rice, mm -hmm. uh, with your pine, um, pine nuts. Uh, and, they also made their own wine. Yeah, they made their own wine. Which there. was delicious. And that's why we always wanted to stay in town because we knew we were going to be stumbling home from the <laughs> That's <Diva>. right. <laughs> but in the town itself, there are... Multiple. All kinds of hotels that, you know, range from the very low budget to the very high luxury. Um, and one of the unique features of these hotels is that they've been also carved into the rock. So you can get a cave hotel or a room that's carved in a cave or not if you don't want. And, uh, and the town itself is just a really scenic town and the cave hotels are great to stay in especially in the warmer months which is anywhere from say april to yeah, october um because it has you know no air conditioning but it's nice and cool inside great for sleeping um in the cooler months what's nice about some of them is they have fireplaces That's so you right, can still yeah. keep warm but um 
And I would say, of course, that's a very low season for Cappadocia. There's not a whole lot of people that go in the winter, but it is gorgeous in the winter. We've it's, gone in the winter numerous times. It's harder to get to it. some of the more remote sites because uh, we're talking areas that you have to get to down dirt roads that once it starts snowing, you can't really get to. Well, we uh, had a four wheel sites, drive. So. We did, but the main sites are open. Um, so that's not a problem. And it is beautiful in the in the winter with the snow covering. And once again, you can go everything. there. You can get there easily. Cappadocia has a couple of um, airports in the area. Yeah. Nothing's that far away from each other, but I mean, it's not walkable, but you can um, easily get a driver or take a tour. I mean, you can even take, I'm not sure if you can take a day tour or if it's like an overnight tour out of Istanbul, if you're just in Istanbul oh, or in even, Izmir. We never even mentioned the underground cities, did we? Well, that's where the, that's where the but the Crusaders actual were. it is but we're but there are actual cities that have been carved into underground I and mean, we we've just been talking about these things that are carved in like the sides of the hills or or in the towers themselves but there are also areas where the ground is completely flat and um they dug in dug down deep into multiple layers and created cities where everybody could live and hide during attacks. Uh, so yeah, a little bit different than what we were talking about before, but those are really fascinating, really fascinating. I want to make sure we mention that. Yeah. Oh, Cappadocia is an amazing place to really get the most out of it. I don't think you should go there with less than three days, Yeah. even though there are plenty of tours that take you there basically for a day or a day and a half. Um, and they'll take you to the gourmet museum, which is amazing. But it's not the only thing there is to see. That's right. Um, so do we need to... Okay, so let's rank. Do rank we it. Go we didn't really have that many different ones. We didn't. I think we can all agree on number one if we want to go from one down. Yeah. One is definitely Cappadocia. Two yes. is definitely Kiskalesi. Now that's where it starts to get... We, from there we have the Black Sea, Gaziantep, Ankara, Pamukkale... Anything else you had? Uh, oh, and Yazakaya. I, I, I got to say, I got to take Yazakaya yeah, off okay, the list. Yeah, okay, we can take Yazakaya. Only because it's just too hard for people to get to. And Not um, that I think it's any lesser for it. In fact, it's probably better for it. But yes. I just don't well, think it's going to go it. there. And if you've got a car and you are doing turkey self-drive, uh, which is the best way to do it, you're going to find things like Yazakaya all throughout the country. So. In fact, we have a lot something like 80 articles on Turkey on our website, yeah, Reflections and Root. Right. So definitely take a look at that if you're planning a trip and drop us a line. We'll get, we'll tell you, you know, okay, how so to do things. I guess I would put number three, Gaziantep. Would you? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. for me, for, for me, or no, Pamukkale. for me, I would say Pamukkale. Okay. Let's say Pamukkale. If you agree with that. Because I have Pamukkale on my list too. I just didn't mention it. Just it didn't because fit. of its combination of, of, well, it's the so three different things that are that are very unique. Yeah, it, that's what it is. It's the uniqueness. You can't find that anywhere else right. in the world. Yeah. Okay, good. I like that. So And by the way, when we when we went to Cleopatra's pool, we've been a few times, but we only swam in the pool one time, and that happened to be in February, and it was beautiful. It was incredible. The weather was pretty nice that day. But it was, of course, cold out because it was February. Mm -hmm. um, but we were so comfortable. We were the only ones in the pool. It was Water wonderful. Was perfect. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, Cappadocia for number one. Kuskalesi number two. Pamukkale number three. Number four. Gaziantep. Gaziantep. And the things around Gaziantep. Uh, and then I still think you need to keep Ankara on the and list. And then Ankara, number five. Yeah. Uh, which includes Bay Pizarre and uh, well, you know, there's a lot to do right around Ankara. We didn't even talk about Gordian, um, which has Midas's tomb and an old castle as and well. And where Alexander cut the Gordian and knot. where Alexander cut the Gordian knot. That's right. Uh, so just incredible history right in that one little area. Roman ruins. It's all there. And shopping. And Caesar was and even through there. super accessible. In fact, uh, it's a great place to fly into the country and make Maybe not as a base, but definitely spend some time there and then uh, maybe head to Gaziantep and spend some time there and then maybe head to Kuskalesi. Uh, you got to go. Depends on how much time you have, but 
or how many times you plan on going to Turkey. Mm-hmm. But Turkey is an amazing place mm-hmm. to go. And the more you go, the more you'll find you'll need to go back. That's right. So uh, and Istanbul, like we said, it's not that it didn't make the list. It's that it's kind of its own category. It, I agree with that. Now, no matter where you go, you're going to hear these words over and over again. Çok güzel, which means very good. And that's a great word to learn because that's an excellent response for anything that you see, do, do taste, <laughs> Uh, or anybody you may, you know, little children, choke gazelle, the tea that you're drinking, choke gazelle. Everything is very beautiful. That's right. Well, we hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Turkey and where we suggest that you go. Like we said, it's one of the countries that we love the best. So we can talk Talk more and more and more and more about it. Um, But we won't. Um, If you... Have any questions, drop us a line and join our private Facebook group at Streets and Eats. And then you you can ask away and we will help you out. Yeah. And if you have any recommendations for things in Turkey that you think we left out uh, or should have made our list, share those. We'd love to hear them. There's plenty. I think one place people have, a lot of people have gone because of cruises is um, Roman Ruins. Or maybe they're Greek ruins. They're Greek ruins of Ephesus and the Greek ruins of yeah, Troy. We didn't even talk about Ephesus. And we didn't even talk about that whole <laughs> East Coast. And there's tons of stuff over there. So there's plenty more. Trust us. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. We appreciate you. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Streets and Eats. If you liked what you heard, please show us some love. Hit the like button and leave us a review. Maybe even subscribe so you don't miss any future podcasts. Also, we'd love it if you joined us on our Facebook private group, Streets Needs, where we just have an ongoing conversation about all things travel. Ciao for now.